So, um, my name is Larry Kane. I'm a partner in Oryx um, Technology uh, Group Practice Group. And I just got an email from somebody in the group. Okay, I'll ignore that. So, um, uh, a little little background on Oryx TCG Group. Um, so, Oryx is an uh, international firm, but it focuses on three areas. Technology, energy, and finance. I'm in the technology practice group. Um, I have a quick slide to give you a sense of how uh, international practice group is and how many deals we do. Um, you know, represent 2,700 technology companies, 365 venture VC type clients. Um, uh, I think in 2019, we did $18.9 billion of venture financings. Um, and 29.6 billion dollars of m a deals i think the main point on this slide uh, is that we see lots of deals from early stage all the way through unicorn stage and um as we go through the slides if i go too fast um uh, please ask a question um, i like to usually make this usually we do this presentation in person and I try to give lots of examples and make this a discussion. Um, and if somebody has a specific question, they're working on a financing now, um, as we go through the slides, please ask it because I'm sure the question that you're gonna, that you have, somebody else may have. Um, next slide, Amir. Uh, next slide, can you hear me? Okay, um, next slide. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is um, seed financings. And sometimes we hear the word pre-seed, uh, but the form of a, a seed finance. And so we're not going to, I'm not going to make that distinction. Um, the, the real differences between a pre-seed and a seed financing is really valuations. But generally the, the, the legal and economic terms are basically the same. Um, today, there are three basic um, uh, forms of seed financings. Uh, one is convertible notes. Two is convertible equity. People often will use the term safes uh, or kisses. Um, and then there's a, a price round called a series seed preferred stock. And I'm just going to briefly say what they are, and then we'll get into more specifics and going through it. But Convertible note is very simply uh, a note that will a debt instrument. You take, say, mirror has got a startup and he wants a hundred thousand dollars. He'll take that as as a convertible note, which is technically debt, and that will accrue interest and look like any other loan instrument. But if and when you get to an equity financing that's priced it will automatically convert into that equity financing, usually at a discount or a cap valuation. Uh, a convertible equity instrument or a safe or a KISS, <clears throat> uh, and, and KISS is just a, a form of a safe that um, uh, 500 startups started years ago. Um, it's got a little more uh, meat to the terms and, um, and a little more probably investor friendly. But generally, um, generally, the difference between a convertible note and a, and a safe uh, or a convertible equity certificate is that it starts off as equity and it's not dead on the balance sheet and it will convert into preferred stock at the time you, you do a, a future financing. Um, Series C preferred stock um, is actually a, a direct sale of stock. And, and so you will price the stock, you will set all the, the terms of the preferred stock and amend your charter and issue a stock instrument. So the legal work between the convertible note and the convertible equity is a lot more on a priced Series C preferred stock. Um, and we'll get into all the pros and cons of the different things, uh, different instruments in a moment. I just want to give you a sense of what they are. The one question I just want to answer right now 
is common stock. Because I have a lot of um, uh, early stage investors say, well, why don't I just sell common stock? We <clears throat> already have it authorized in the charter. Why don't I just sell common stock? And generally there are two primary reasons why we don't see common stock used um, for seed financings. Uh, first of all, the investors are going to want to have uh, preferential rights on getting their money out, meaning that they're putting their hard money in, they want their hard money out first before the sweat equity comes in. So in, in general, you're going to have an investor's uh, perspective that their investment um, will have to come out first. And then, um, and then on the converse side, entrepreneurs need to be very protective of, of the value of their common stock. And so usually there are two problems that, that often happen. The first problem is founders will start their company and they're moving really fast and they may have not done all their paperwork and got their common stock issued to their team or to themselves. And if you start selling common stock to investors at a much higher valuation, uh, you've now priced that common stock and you can't issue common stock to an investor, say at a dollar a share, and then issue common stock to a founder or an investor, uh, um, you know, advisor or somebody at like a penny a share. There's a tax, implication that that difference in value must be compensation to the founder. And so it's really important that if you are going to be looking to do seed financing and you're still trying to, um, you know, fill out your founding team or your advisors or whatever, that you protect the, the value of the common by keeping it low. If you price it and sell it to an investor at a higher price, then you're going to have to price all your other you know, advisors and everybody else at the common, at the, you know, the invest, your, your founders or your advisors at that higher common price. So there's a tax issue there. If you, if you price it to investors at a higher price and two, there's an inability to actually attract new, new talent, because if you were going to tell co a new co-founder or somebody that's going to join you, Hey, I'll give you 10% of the company. But meantime, you've just valued the company, say, I'll make a low value, a million dollars. That's still $100,000 for that person to come in to join the company for 10% of the company. Um, I just want to stop at that moment in time. Does anybody have a question about why not common stock? All right. Uh, next slide. Okay. So why... why uh, do we have convertible notes and safes? So the principal uh, reasons why you see a convertible note or safe is that it's a lot simpler than a priced round. You generally just have potentially a purchase agreement or uh, a note purchase agreement. Sometimes you just have a note or a safe. Um, uh, so the, the number of documents is very limited. Um, in the documents themselves, you have very limited reps and warranties from the company. Uh, maybe that you're just in good standing, been duly incorporated, um, but really basic reps and warranties. Um, with a Series C preferred stock deal, you'll have more reps and warranties. And does everybody uh, and and to understand what a rep and warranty is? It's it's basically a, a promise that your company has these things at the moment of time of the sale. Um, the other uh, main thing why it's cheaper is that it basically punts a lot of the typical protections that an institutional investor will want to a later date. And it basically says to those investors, you'll have a most favored patients clause. You know, whatever the future investors get on a price round, you're gonna get those, but right now, Let's just spend the money on getting the money into the company and growing the business, and we'll deal with those legal rights when we do a price round. Um, another uh, advantage of a, a safe or a note, and this is not necessarily always an advantage over a series seed round because series seeds can have the same thing, but generally 
we will see what we call rolling closings. And in my experience um, with uh, entrepreneurs and founders is that they're always raising money. You know, it's like every, every company, it, it, you're always raising money. Um, and so it's just, it's just, it's one of those things where um, the note or the safe allows you to continuously raise money. Um, and if you've got uh, an increase in the valuation throughout the term of the rolling closing, you stop the valuation at one point and do a new note at a higher valuation. Um, um, second, uh, sorry, higher uh, cap. Um, Another advantage of a uh, convertible note or equity is you actually don't value the business at the time you sell the, the, the note or the safe. What I mean is when you do a series C preferred stock deal, the, the value of the stock is priced. You've got, you know, we'll give an example. Just say you've got 7 million shares and you do um, a $7 million pre-money valuation, you've got a dollar a share and everything's sold on that. If you do a convertible note or a safe and you put a valuation cap of the 7 million, that's technically not the value of the company. It's just the valuation cap, how that converts. You could possibly convert at a lower price if you end up doing your price drawn at a $5 million valuation. Um, so, the, the instrument of a convertible note or safe allows the investor come in, cap the high end of the valuation range, but also protect themselves if there's a lower valuation for whatever reason. The company doesn't meet its milestones, the coronavirus virus hits and everything changes. Um, so the convertible note and safe is very protective on the investor on the valuation. And as you know, evaluating uh, early stage startups is really hard. It's it's really an art, not a science. And there's so many soft factors in that. And by doing the note or the safe, you have reduced um, that tension on getting a deal done. You, you'll negotiate the valuation cap, but 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 you don't have to negotiate the actual valuation. Amir, you were going to say something. Yeah, I'm saying absolutely. It, it's really, it's really, it's really good. So, one one question I have on that, um, um, Larry, that a lot of founders always ask me this question, and there's, I want to hear your thoughts on it. What is considered price round? When is it price round? Consider that. I generally think Series A, and that's why I say it depends on everyone agrees on that. So, what, in your opinion, consider a legal way of saying price round? Well, we'll get to that. That's a Series C. Uh, okay. SED. So uh, it, it's when you actually sell stock, preferred stock, usually Series C or Series A, at a set valuation. So the the convertibles, the valuation may have caps and discounts, but it's not set. Um, you know. So the the other uh, main advantage of a note or a safe is there tends to be less legal diligence and corporate diligence by investor. So when you get to a priced round, when you get to um, a series seed round, venture round, you will see, um, can you hold one second? Sorry. Sorry about that. I have my 10th grader and her <laughs> close. Okay. All right. So, um, so when you get to a real series, a, a real venture round, uh, everything you've done will be diligence by a lawyer, you know, every stock issuing. So look at every, make sure every consultant sign a, con, you know, confidentiality agreement, make sure all your 83s B, B files, like securities, they're going to look at everything you've done for both a legal and a bit. Uh, on a series seed, you may see, a modified level of diligence. Um, when you get to a convertible note or a safe, because they don't really care so much about the cap table, you see less legal diligence. You may still find, you know, it depends upon how big the check somebody's written. If somebody's going to give you a million dollars in a convertible note, 
they're going to do some more diligence. If they're going to give you $50,000, a lot less diligence. And so generally, you know, when I represent investors and doing a convertible note, we're safe. We'll want to make sure that you know, some basic things are done, like it's been duly incorporated. Um, we'll want to make sure that they've done their securities law filings and um, some basic things are in, in the door. But you're not going to you know, spend you know, three weeks or a month where they're doing their diligence to get a deal done, um, which leads to a much quicker um, uh, time period to get the deal done. I mean, I got a call Monday from a client that's got somebody who wants to write them basically a million dollar check on a convertible note, and we'll get the money in by Friday. I mean, it's, it's really quick and easy. Okay, uh, next slide. Some um, disadvantages of convertible notes and, and equity or saves. So um, with convertible notes and saves, it can be a little more expensive than a priced round. So for instance, let's just make an example, Amir. You've got a startup and you negotiate with um, somebody that you're going to have a $5 million cap valuation. And you're thinking this is the valuation and you're going to put in just say $500,000 and just roughly we'll just say that's worth a dollar per share. If it was a priced round, you would just get your shares for that dollar per share, 500,000 shares. You know what you've got. Everybody knows what you've got. And, and you just move forward. Um, with a convertible note or a safe, there can be adjustments in that. So for instance, um, if it's a convertible note, the note will accrue interest over time. So that $500,000, just say it accrues interest at 10%, uh, and it takes you it takes the company you know, two years to get to their price round and convert it, it's now worth $550,000. So the number of shares that, Amir, that you just got because it was a convertible note has gone up by 10% over two years. So you're actually gonna get more shares. Uh, second is if you have uh, a, a, another deal that's gonna be done, I see some emails here, uh, another deal that, that's gonna get done and comes in at a $5 million valuation because you've got a discount, you're actually gonna get more shares. Um, and and the way that the convertible note or safes work is it's got what we call sort of ratchet anti-dilution, meaning if you had done a, a, a price round, a series seed at the $5 million valuation, a dollar per share, and the next round came in, you know, slightly below that or even at that price, um, uh, you, you would not really have much anti-dilution for the series seed, but with the discount and the, uh, automatic repricing with the convertible note or safe, the the number of shares would would would, would be driven higher. That, um, feature of the convertible note or safe that really um, uh, benefits the investor. That's why it's 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 a lot uh, quicker and easier for the investors to write sometimes these checks for convertible notes and safes. Um, and, and they're protected if there's any type of down round financing, if it's a note, they get the added interest. So I always want to remind investors that there is sometimes a price paid on a commercial note or safe that you would not see in a priced round uh, if, if you're happy with the priced round valuation. Um, one other thing, I, I, we'll talk about this more later on, is this in post money safes. Um, uh, the, when, when Y Combinator came out with the safe a few years ago, it was what we call the post money, uh, a pre money safe. And now it's, it's the form has switched to a post money safe. And you have to be very cognizant of which form of safe you're using because the, they have a significant difference to a founder, an entrepreneur on how the safes work. And I just want to walk through that just a little bit. 
And so, you know, if you have a post money safe, you're going to need to be very, very cognizant of how future money raised money is being raised. So with a pre money safe. I'll just give you a real basic example. Um, back to the, to the, we're talking about a valuation of we'll use the example. Amir has got a new startup. Um, he negotiates for a $5 million um, a post money valuation cap for a safe. And he's going to invest, um, or somebody's going to invest $500,000 in that company. And so that represents 10% of the company economics, right? So no matter what, with the post money safe, Amir is going to get 10% of that company. So if the company continues to raise money on that safe, all the dilution of the additional equity or notes or safes that's put in uh, dilutes the founders. It does not dilute um, Amir when this thing converts is going to have 10% of the company. Um, that's what he's driven his bargain to be. And the reason why that isn't always the best for the founders is that in my experience is founders keep raising more and more money uh, with notes and safes. As I talked about earlier, they can do rolling closing, you know, it can take a year or two years to raise additional money. And every dollar you raise dilutes the founder. And what normally would happen is with the pre money safe is that that additional money dilutes everybody pro rata. So if we end up doing, you know, in, in the example, like that same deal, um, if you have $5 million pre-money valuation and you end up raising, you know, a million dollars, you have, you know, post money, 6 million, 5 million plus one is 6 million. And the investors would have 1 million out of, out of the six uh, million. You know, so one sixth of, of, of the company in, in numbers of shares. Um, in the post money safe, Amir would still get his 10% and everybody else would share the balance. And and that drives the dilution down to, to the founder. I know I'm giving a, a quick example because I got a lot to cover. Do, do people have questions? Is that getting through the difference between a pre money and a post money safe? Larry, I have a quick question on that. Um, say, for example, the investors, they, they know what they're doing and they ask the founder, oh, I need a post money save. What are the um, levers a founder can apply to negotiate that deal and where the assumption is the founder doesn't want the post money save? So when you're raising money, it's all about if I'm representing an, uh, a founder yep. and they got lots of choices, lots of people want to write, you know, give them money, then you can pretty much stick to the pre-money safe. If an investor, you know, is you know, very much like, I need the post money safe and the, the amount is not a lot, just say it's $50,000. And doesn't draw, right. you know, so if the amount was a lot, like say $500,000, I would tell them, let's just price the round. Let's just do a series seed, price the round, get it done and, and, and move on because, uh, the, the long-term price to you will be a lot more expensive if you do the post money safe, um, and, and versus the, the do a series seed is more expensive, but it's still pretty cheap. Um, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars more. Um, and so, you know, if, if the check is big enough, say $500,000 or a million, but just say, say 500,000 or even 250, I'd probably encourage them to price the round. If it's small, say 25 or 50, then the, the founder really needs to understand that this is a toxic, you know, not toxic necessarily, but this is, um, an instrument that is fear, you know, will incentive, they, 
give them a high incentive to get to a price round sooner than later. I see. Because you want to convert that instrument. So it's, you know, one of my philosophies is I like to have investors and founders always aligned. And, um, and, um, and to me, when you raise additional money into the company, it's, it's good for both founders and investors and it shouldn't just dilute the founders. Um, and I understand why investors like the post money safe. Um, there's two main benefits for them. First and four or three main benefits. First and foremost is it, it, it does push and investors will tell you this. It does push the founders to get to that price round sooner than later. They, they want you to get to that price round. Because it'll hopefully get to that milestone quicker. Um, two, it secures their deal, right? They they know what they got. I gave you, you know, hundred thousand dollars and a million dollar cap. I got ten percent of the company. I know I've got that, and so um, they really like that protection. And three, there's a tax argument. Um, we'll, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later on. But there's something called small business stock or 1202 stock. And there's a there's a tax benefit to um, to investors where if you purchase small business stock and you hold the stock for five years um, and the company is an operating company and there's certain other restrictions there, but, but generally those are the main things. You know, company is a small business company, less than $50 million of assets, which all the startups will be and if you hold it for five years, when you sell the stock, um, it's uh, right now 100% exclusion from federal capital gains. I'll repeat that again, 100% exclusion from federal capital gains. So if I purchased stock, you know, $100,000 in the small business stock, and, and there are some caps to it, I'm gonna ignore the caps for the moment, but just, just you know, generally, if I sell that, you hold it for five years, sell it for a million dollars. I don't pay any federal capital gains. That's a huge benefit for investors. Um, so the one of the requirements for that is you buy stock, uh, not buy a convertible. So a convertible note or convertible equity necessarily does not trigger the holding period, the five-year period on that. Um, there is some tax um, uh, consultants out there, CPAs out there who say, well, a post money safe qualifies. We can start our holding period. You know, we at ORC have not come to that conclusion, but there's investors who take that position. And so one of the reasons why they want the post money safe is to get that holding period started for their, their small business stock. Um, and if you think about it, if you if you make an investment and you hold it for five years, you get this huge benefit. If it's a convertible note and you've held it for five years, but it takes you know two years to convert it, you only have three more years. You only have three years then, and you know so you have to require another two more years. So there is a, an incentive there to um, to get the stock. I think that's a very good, uh, a great point because. Um, if an investor uh, thinks that way, then uh, either um, being a founder, either they can ask for more uh, larger check size or um, so that they can meet their needs, right? Yeah, no question. So again, if I'm an investor, um, you know, and this QSBS is important, it's less important for um, institutional investors because it's only um, the QSBS status is is um, for basically only individuals. I see. Uh, so, so in for individual investors or for small funds that basically are pass throughs, um, it's an important thing. For you know larger funds. That have already, you know, most of their LPs may be pension funds or non taxpayers. It's less of an interest. Um, but there are definitely, in the in my experience, the active investors in the seed and the pre seed market, this is an important factor to them. And so I, I do think one of the reasons why 
it, like the post money saves. I mean, there's lots of reasons why I like it, but one of it is this QSBS um, qualified small business stock category. Um, a couple other things about um, convertible notes, necessarily not a disadvantage too much, but generally there's going to be a question is what happens if you sell the company and you haven't converted the note or the safe? So you've started the business, you've raised, you know, a million dollars of convertible notes or safes. You haven't gotten to a, a price round to convert those into the price round and you're going to be sold. And that happens a lot more than you think. Um, I've got a client now, we've raised a safe, $500,000 a safe, and they've got an offer from a, a company to sell them. And it's not a huge win. It's, you know, a couple million dollars, but, you know, today, who knows what, with, you know, the pandemic, what's going to happen. So they may end up doing that deal. Um, so when we get to the, to the safe terms and the note terms, um, the sophisticated investor will ask for a multiple um you know 2x 3x sometimes even up to 5x but that's not market um you know return on their money automatic so that's just something to note is, is a common term um so you know so the you know in my example just say you've got five hundred thousand dollars a note and it's a 3x return you know that's 1.5 million to go to the note holders even though that's way below the percentage of the company maybe they'd, they'd be entitled to have um, a couple other things just to note, um, um, sometimes not often, but, but we'll do, we will see convertible notes, uh, have security interests, meaning that the investors will require the company to pledge its assets to secure the notes. Um, it happened to me only one time in my long career where, uh, we had, a uh, Convertible note. I think we were up to about two million dollars of convertible notes. The investors wanted wanted it secured. The company could not convert the notes, and basically the lead investor then foreclosed on the company and took, you know, took the assets IP of the company in exchange for their notes. Um, and so again, a note is a debt instrument, just like if you borrow money on your house, you know, you secure it. So if you default on your mortgage and don't meet the terms, the, the lender can, you know, foreclose. In this case, they took the IP and they sold the IP to another company. Um, uh, so something to be aware of. It's, it's not equity if it's a note. Um, the most favored nations clause, I don't really see always as a disadvantage, but it's just something that you should know that, you know, basically when you're, you're doing these deals that you can't really, um, Cherry pick, uh, meaning you can't, you, you have to basically give all the investors the same, the same terms uh, on that deal. Um, you can't at the same time tell one investor to get one deal and another investor another deal. You have to treat people the same and that um, investors will often look for most favored nations clauses to protect themselves. Um, other issues with notes, which we'll talk about further later on is what happens at maturity. So, um, safes don't have maturity, but notes do. And, and so we often will see long maturity day. You know, what happens to that note? Does it roll over? Can they, in my example, I just gave, you know, could somebody say, pay me? Um, there's lots of issues with a, um, a note at maturity and that needs to be discussed and negotiated. So it, again, it's not equity, it's debt. Um, the one thing I, I would note, uh, as you can sort of see through this slide, is that um, there are lots of issues embedded into, into notes and, and safes. And, you know, I, I always encourage, you know, if you're going to be out there raising money, um, and we see this all the time where people want to save money, you know, be penny wise, sometimes pound foolish is they'll go on to the website and just like pull off a form without really understanding what the form means. And um, there's lots of long-term issues that can be embedded in, into your note or your safe and not understanding how it impacts you, you know, 
six months from now, how it impacts your next financing is is a problem. So we 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 don't recommend just taking a form from the internet and say, oh, oh, let's use this safe because not all safes are the same. Uh, not all notes are the same. And so really recommend you talking to a lawyer or an advisor that understands these terms that can help you walk you through them. The next slide. Give me the next slide. Okay. So the reason why safes um, developed a few years ago, um, so the history of this was um, you had price rounds and that was the standard. And then we had sort of what we call bridge, bridge rounds that were generally short-term rounds, um, three to six months. And those were always done as convertible notes. And then those deals got extended to be larger deals and longer maturity dates. But we still had these problems of the convertible notes being debt with the interest and so forth. So a few years ago, um, a concept called convertible equity Y Combinator came out with safes, um, 500 startups did kisses, but there's a whole number of, you know, convertible equity instruments. Safes now sort of a common terminology. Um, the, the principle of the safe over convertible note is that it's not debt. So if you technically wanted to give potential somebody your balance sheet and you've got a million dollars of convertible notes technically your balance sheet should indicate that as debt so you don't have a clean balance sheet if you've done that as a safe that goes into the equity column and it's it's clean um and the safes take away three problems with the convertible notes it takes away no accruing interest no maturity date and there's no potential for that security interest that you could do with the note because it, it is equity. Um, there is a, a, a side benefit for investors that that also safe solve. Um, technically, in California, if you are an active investor and you're doing convertible notes, you need to actually register as a California lender. Um, and there's a registration. There's a de minimis exception for like one or two deals a year, but uh, many investors are very active in the market and will do many more deals than that a year. And so uh, because safes aren't loans, um, there's, no, there's no lender requirement, uh, registration requirement, if, if they're doing lots of safes. I know lots of investors ignore that, but it is, it is a potential issue that the safe solve over a note. Okay, next slide. Okay. Some, some uh, disadvantages of the safe um, that people should be aware of. Um, we already talked about it a little bit. So typically if you have a safe or a convertible note, you don't start your holding period um, for small business stock. There is that debate I mentioned about post money safes uh, do trigger it. Um, there's no consensus whether that's correct or not. Um, it is a newer form of security. And so out here in San Francisco and Silicon Valley Bay Area, many, many investors are very familiar and comfortable with safes. But outside of the Bay Area, it's less known. Most people don't know what it is and um, aren't very comfortable with it. Uh, I have another client that we raised about $500,000 of saves from local investors. And as soon as he went outside, he, the founder was a man, uh, outside the Bay Area, he was having significant pushback on it. And I think internationally, like if you were going to raise money from international investors, it's really confusing to them, um, you know, what, what this safe is. Um, so there is that tension here. You know, what, what is it? I, I'd rather have a, something I know. I, I want a convertible note or a price round. Um, 
Amir, I'm not sure whether in, in your experience, because you guys see maybe some more international deals, but I, I, I don't think there's an equivalent concept anywhere else in the world to a safe. It's, it's really a, no, a US. That is not. I mean, yeah. Europe's, Europe kind of trying to do it, uh, but they haven't actually finalized anything at this point, but um, nothing in Asia at this point, uh, nothing yet. So if you were going to, you know, if I would recommend to investors, if, you're, if your investor base is really non-US, I think the safe would be really hard sell. I think if it's primarily the area uh, or with investors who are very active in the seed, pre-seed market, not an issue. Um, but if you're going to not those types of investors, expect that to get some pushback on it. I see a question, how about New York City and Boston? I think those markets are generally fine if it's, again, investors who are active in the pre-seed seed market. I, I represent a number of investors from New York and they are always out in Silicon Valley and they're doing lots of deals and they do lots of saves. Um, you know, that said, um, I do think New York investors come more out of the private equity space and um, it, it's it's harder for some of that, you know, people with that experience to do the saves. I think they'd rather have the convertible note or a priced round. A couple other things that you should note if you're going to go do a safe, and I, I point these out um, mainly because the starting point is often you use a wide combinator safe. And again, there's the pre-money safe and the post-money safe. But on these terms, neither one are pro often deal with these problems. So when I represent uh, uh, an investor doing a seed investment, and again, if it's a $25,000, $50,000 check, I may not care about these issues, but if it's a, a larger check size, 250, 500, you know, some real money being put, put to work, um, I will want to have uh, these rights. Um, you know, so these rights are not built into the safe forms generally. Um, investor information rights, investor inspection rights, uh, investor rights to participate in, in future financing necessarily. Um, uh, a most favored nations clause, meaning you're not going to give a, a safe on better terms than the terms I'm getting. And sometimes we'll ask for some additional reps and warranties uh, that the safes don't have. Um, and so often when I'm representing um, companies that are doing safes will walk through the safe form and sometimes um, build into the safe form some of these basic rights. Um, so we cut off comments because it's more expensive often to, to do a bunch of side letters or mend the safe and now we have two safes that are not matching than to basically give some basic investor protections that shouldn't be a problem right in, in, in the investment, in, in the safe um, to, to satisfy these questions. Um, and these rights, like the information inspection rights and rights to participate, you wouldn't give that to somebody writing you a $25,000 check, but you may give those rights to somebody writing you a $500,000 check or a 250 check or a million dollar check. So there's what we call a major investor status and we will, um, tie those rights to the level of investment. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, okay. Why series seed? Uh, so again, um, series seed preferred stock is a priced round. So the first two convertible notes and convertible um, equity or safes, those Somebody puts in $100,000, and if and when you do a priced round, it will convert into the priced round. So instead of doing the convertibles, let's just do the deal. And so why, why you know, do we do a Series C? Um, you know, it's, you know, there's no interest, like a convertible note. There's no discounts. Basically, you'll know what each side gets. The company will sell blank shares or um, set, set of money. So it, it's, it's, it's basically the deal is set 
and, and you can move forward. Um, it's equity, so the balance sheet is clean. Um, now, one advantage of the Series C versus the a Series A is like, like the convertible note equity, it's designed to be pretty fast and quick. Um, it's not a full-blown venture round. So if you are doing a full-blown venture round, the Series A preferred stock round, you would see lots of documents, uh, investor rights agreements, voting agreements, rights of first pursuit, co-sale agreements, a lengthy charter agreement, uh, a very lengthy Series A purchase agreement with lots of reps and warranties. Uh, if you look at the National Venture Capital Association, the NVCA um, venture capital forms, they're all online and they're free. There's probably like 200 pages of documents, maybe 250 pages of documents. Um, and um, they're really great documents, they're very well thought of, but it just, it, it takes a lot of time and energy to do a venture deal. So the Series C deal um, basically is a much shorter, abbreviated set of documents that give basic uh, investor rights. Um, you know, it, it allows you to price the deal and give the, the investor preferred stock. Um, so it's more complicated than this, the note and the safe, which is, you know, just a few pages long usually, you know, one or two documents. Uh, the series seed would be, you know, usually a purchase agreement, a charter amendment. Sometimes they have another document. This depends which, which law firm is doing the document. Um, there's a great website called seriesseed.com. Um, I think they've got it down to two documents. Um, longer than a note, you know, a safe, but instead of 300 pages of documents, you may have 20 pages of documents or 15 pages of documents. And they're set up pretty much to be as cookie cutter as you can get them. Um, so they're pretty fast. They're uh, relatively cheap, much cheaper than a full-blown Series A, but still a little more more expensive. Okay, so um, the because it's shorter, you don't have all the full full-blown rights of a Series A. So the investors, you know, still take some. Uh, understand that they're going to have to wait to the Series A to get all their rights. Um, and it does, you know, lock in the 1202 uh, small business stock um, um, time period. Next, next slide. Okay. Um, so, some common basic disadvantages of a series seed is obviously a little more expensive. Um, I put in two x in time legal costs. Again, that cost number. And the time period is really dependent upon how much negotiation there is between the company and the investor. Um, most um, law firms, big law firms like Oric, um, there's also the seriesseed.com site, have fairly standardized documents. Um, and so if we're working with an investor that's got, you know, good counsel that knows what they're doing, they'll know our documents and know, you know, so it's, it's pretty, usually pretty quick and fast. Um, but there could be somebody who's not as familiar with it and we'll start negotiating some of these rights. So the, the, the cost factor on, on the Series C really depends upon the investment level and investors level of, of you know, their counsel. And how much legal diligence they're going to do, and that cost could be more than two x, you know, it could be five x, um, or it could be closer to the same cost. Uh, it just depends upon the level of diligence and negotiation. But I, I generally tell clients, you know, if they ask me the difference in cost, you know, just it'd be probably two x, um, and probably a little bit, you know, if I get a convertible note done in a week, the C deal will take two weeks. Um, any questions so far? All right. So, um, one of the other main issues with the Series C is it forces the valuation. And so, as we get into these deals, um, 
you have to get to evaluation. And when we're looking at a convertible note or safe, if you have a very low cap, so just for example, um, the cap is $2.5 million and the person's gonna give you a sizable check of 500,000. I might as well just do the series seed because that you're basically the cap is the valuation because it's so low. If you've got a really high cap, you know, $20 million cap, $15 million cap. Um, but if you were gonna price the round today, um, you know, you, you'd be hard, you know, they may want a much lower price. So again, it, it's gonna force that valuation. Um, you know, one of the common, common things I get from clients is, well, I'm gonna have my friend price the round. I'm gonna have somebody friendly price the round. That, that could work if the person is truly, you know, can have the sophistication to lead. Seed, seed investment. We generally want to have a lead investor, somebody that uh, other investors will say, okay, this price seems fair. Um, they know what they were doing. I, I wouldn't have, you know, somebody, you know, putting in $25,000 and saying, um, this is the price of the round. Cause that this, you're not gonna have sophisticated investors maybe agree on that price. And the last thing you want to do is do a series seed and then have to amend the documents and change the price. That's a lot of work. So that's the, something that you don't want to do. Um, sometimes the lead investor will want a board seat, depends upon how much money they're putting in. And then they'll have these other rights set in that aren't always set in the saves and notes. Um, but sophisticated investors I mentioned will want these. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, what are the key terms that you'll see in a save for a note? So when we do save, I always recommend that our clients put together a basic term sheet. And this helps for the client to understand what the deal is, as well as the investor. And the reason is, Without a term sheet, you don't really know what's going on. And without a term sheet, you know, if you just send somebody a save for a note, you're requiring them to read through the document and they may not understand it. So some of the key key terms um, for a save for note is how much money are you really trying to raise? Um, and I always recommend putting a little bit more than you think you 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 need because I mean, as you know. Raising money, always, I mean, starting a startup always seems to take longer and cost more. Um, so if you think you, you need to raise only $500,000 of notes or safes, I'd recommend building in um, uh, 750. Um, so you want to build in a little cushion. Uh, we always see with safes and notes rolling closings. We usually uh, allow rolling closings for up to 180 days. We've got clients that go longer. Um, you sometimes see a minimum raise, something like, you know, got to have $500,000. We're not going to issue any money. Um, we don't see that a lot, but we do see that from time to time. Another key term in these notes and safes is what we call the financing conversion trigger. This is the amount of money you need to raise to trigger the conversion. Generally, the, the market number is 2 million, can be a little lower, can be a little higher, depends upon factors of the company. And what investors want is that you're not gonna just raise, you know, $100,000 or $50,000 and convert their note into that round at that price. The investors wanna see a real financing amount with a real investor who would have negotiated, you know, real rights for the investors. Um, interest rates on notes, most common is 8%, but, but I've seen as low as, you know, two or 3%. I've never seen anything really higher than 10. Investors are not investing these convertible notes for the interest. They're investing it because of the upside of the business. Um, I often will start with 5% uh, 
um, go to eight percent sometimes. Um, maturity dates: uh, the longer, the better for entrepreneurs. And this is again for convertible notes only. Um, when we first came out with these, we'd often see six months. Then they went to a year. Now we see twenty-four months is pretty common. There is that lender le the lender issue. Um, on registration for notes longer than 12 months, because that could require a registration for them. Um, discounts on conversion, market is 20%. They often range from 10 to 30. I've seen clients get um, um, will use the discount in different ways to attract investors. For instance, you know, the first $5 million or first $500,000 of investment will have maybe a higher discount and the next 500,000 would have a lower discount. And then the next 500 would have even a lower. So they, they tranche the discounts based upon how much you raise, trying to give the persons who come in earlier that have the higher risk, uh, more of a discount. Um, the conversion cap is just, you know, whatever is negotiated based upon the company. And remember, the way that the conversion works is that the conversion is the conversion of the note into the instrument will be at the higher, sorry, the low, the lower of of the price determined by the, the the discount or the conversion cap. So, real quickly, if you have a five million dollar conversion cap, that will be the you know price per the price per share will be based upon that five million. Unless the discount gives you a lower number. So if you did a financing price round at the 5 million, 20% of 5 million would give you, you know, basically a $4 million valuation. You would use that uh, to determine the, the conversion price. So basically you'd have to do your, your um, price round, you know, 20% um, higher than the cap to start using to, to get to the cap. Uh, otherwise the discount will give you a lower number. Um, one of the issues is when you sell the company and you haven't converted it is, you know, what's the return? We've talked about that. Usually there's a premium um, on that. Next slide real quick. We're running out of time. Um, I think I'm going to skip these, the, this slide, real, but the only thing to note is with sometimes, if you go back for one second. Just the one thing I would note is sometimes you will see with convertible notes, uh, if you've got a sophisticated investor, them act, asking for some negative covenants, meaning that you company can't do these without their consent. Mostly they relate to um, no new security interests, so something called a negative pledge, uh, no additional debt without consent, and they may ask for security. On occasion, we'll see a board seat or a board observer, right? But that's not very market these days. Okay, next one. Next slide. Um, this happens a lot where you basically have come up with a valuation cap and a discount, and still you have an investor who says, this is not enough. I need a lower cap or lower discount. Um, as I mentioned, you can't give somebody a really a special deal that there's lots of securities law issues with it. Um, however, if the investor can really add value to your business and would be an advisor to you, or maybe join your board, you can give them within market, um, some type of advisor equity. And my only point is you need to understand that everything you do need to be disclosed to other investors. So don't don't try to do things that you know you have to be honest and you're going to need to disclose it. So you know if you're going to go give an investor some advisor equity, it's got to be reasonable and something within within the you know what you give other advisors. Next slide. Um, just some uh, just a couple things to note. Um, but, you know, safes, there's the wide common form. We've talked about that. All the law firms like ORC have their own forms. I've heard a certain form, the KISS form. I like that form, actually. It's a pretty, it's, 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 it's a fairly neutral form. Um, uh, one thing to note, 
is just because you have the form of agreement doesn't mean it's done right. So to properly issue any convertible, you're going to need to do securities law filings with the states, potentially a reg D filing with, with the SEC. You have to get board consents. Um, and if you don't follow these practices and get them done right, it can be problems for your venture rounds. It can lead to rescission rights. It leads to lots of issues. So again, make sure you talk to a lawyer if you're going to do these things, because if you do it wrong, it, it actually creates problems later on. Uh, next slide. Um, so this slide was just briefly talking about some of the key rights for a series D financing. Um, I think we'll just skip it. You know, basically the series seed is going to have basic preferred stock rights, but not all the rights. Um, the last thing I had just, just briefly, you got to make sure we talk about this for a moment is Whenever you issue um, stock in the United States, and I'm sure it's the same in, in most places in the world, um, you need to issue it in compliance with applicable securities laws. In the United States, we have both federal SEC law rules and state rules. Each state has their own securities law. Um, it comes from way back in the 19th, 20s where people were selling stock and people would say, I can sell stock in the sky. So I could sell, you know, the blue sky and people would buy shares in it. So the state securities laws came into play first to stop people from sign, you know, selling uh, stock in the sky and they're still called the blue sky laws. So they're just state securities laws. But in general, when in the United States, if you're issuing or selling securities, and a safe is a security, a convertible note's a security, obviously a series seed is a security, you need to comply with these laws. And either you're gonna need to register this, the stock or the, the security, the, the note or the safe, uh, or find an exemption. You're obviously not gonna register them because you're not gonna, you know, registration means going public. You know, that's a long, expensive process. You're not gonna do that. So you're gonna be selling them under exemptions. The most common exemption that we see for seed financing to the United States is what we call a Reg D offering, Rule 506. And with that rule, there are some requirements. And um, so we, we're gonna really emphasize three, three things that are really important. No general solicitations. So what does that mean? That means you can't be putting onto your website um, I'm selling stock. If you're interested in buying stock, you know, email me. You can't be doing social media, doing a stock offering. You're not supposed to be going to conferences saying, I'm selling stock, you know, please call me. Those all be deemed general solicitations. Okay. And and the SEC, you know, could easily check into that. Now there is a methodology with a reg D offering that you can do a general solicitation. Uh, there are lots of rules on that, and I'm not going to get into it today. But uh, but but if somebody says, "Oh, that lawyer doesn't really talk about," it, you can do one. You can do one under Rule 506C. There are there are um, additional restrictions on it. Um, two is that um, uh, please keep your investors to accredited investors. I get this question all the time. Well, why can't I have, you know, a friend of mine give me $15,000, even though he's not accredited. So that investor could blow your whole offering and within the rules, in the rule, in the reg D rules, there's basically a requirement to do a very lengthy disclosure document, almost like an S1 uh, for non-accredited investors. Um, so no one does those, it's way too expensive. So please keep it to, to only accredited investors. Um, three is there's gonna be required securities law filings. Um, there's gonna be a form D with the SEC. There, in California, there's always a filing, usually a 25 f filing, but wherever your investors are, it's not where the company is, where the investors are is will trigger which state laws you have to comply with. Um, the law is, don't use unregistered brokers. Um, 
you're going to have to disclose your form D, create lots of issues. Um, we could do another session about, you know, talking about unregistered brokers, but an unregistered broker in California can create lots of issues for you. Okay. I know I went a little long. Does it, do people have questions? I feel like I've talked a lot and this is more of a conversation for me. I do have a, I do have a question um, when it comes down to uh, a lot of folks reach out to me um, and others that I've seen over LinkedIn. Oh, we were looking to looking for investment. Can you, you know, this is our pitch tag. This is our one pager. Like, is it, is it legal to do so? Number one and number two, because it really doesn't work in a lot of cases, but that's come, something I want to understand that. Is that legal to do it? So, do the per, does the person? Um, so that could be yes or no. So, if, if they're just sending that out to lot, like they don't even know the people, there's no pre pre existing relationship with the person, then that could be a that could be deemed to be a general solicitation. Now, if you are connected to the person, the person knows you or knows you through another contact and they're being more targeted and solicited, meaning that, that and you can get pre-existing. So the, the terminology on general solicitation is, is there often a pre-existing relationship? And you can get that directly or indirectly. So for instance, uh, we often, um, we often um, will be asked to make introductions and we do that all the time. Um, and the way that will work is you know these uh, potential we've worked with them before. So we have a pre-existing relationship with them. And so we're connecting the two. And we don't get a fee for that, right? So we just it's just it's just pure introduction. Um, so somebody is just sending you out of the blue something, it's probably okay. Um, but if they're sending it out to probably, not. you know, so there's, there's a range if they're like, and, and this is something that you're already connected to on LinkedIn. Um, no, actually that's like, that's, you know, on LinkedIn, when someone connects with you, there is a feature where they can write a small message. And a lot of people do that. And, and a lot of people the other way around where they just connect with you first and then they send it. So, I mean, I, and, and this is, I mean, I, People should think about, um, like, I guess he's. If I, was, about if I was representing that company, I would would want to have a discussion with that person because it could be a, a general solicitation. Okay. If, if, if the person, you know, you, um, um, and had some connection with you, then maybe it's it's fine. But if there's no connection, a thousand people. It feels like a general solicitation, doesn't it? Yeah, but what about the general solicitation for common stock versus just for like, you know, the like safe offering, right? So as you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you know, if I'm saying I'm selling stock in my company, that's a different situation, but I'm just looking for investment. For example, a lot of these founders who are here today, if they're just looking for investment and I say as a safe offering or something like that, would that be like no doubt would that how is that differentiates? All the same, uh, common stock notes. Nope. They're all securities. Okay. They're all securities. You all have to comply with the securities law. So, does it really matter the form of the security? Uh, you, you saw this. We saw this a lot with the um, with the tokens, right? <laughs> yeah. In, in, in two years ago, three years ago, a uh, year and a half ago, you know, we had the big token rush where everybody was trying to do. Um, an ICU or token offering, and they were making arguments that the tokens weren't securities. And the SEC was very, no, these are securities. So it doesn't matter what you call it, if it's basically an investment contract, you know, basically a, an instrument that is made for investment. And there's something called the Howey test. I'm not going to get into all that. But, but, but everything we're talking about, there are securities. You need to comply with the securities laws. And, um, uh, you know, I've had a client who, uh, despite very clear advice, you know, not to post things on their website and not to do certain things, 
um, uh, did them, and the SEC did an investigation, and they had to basically return all the money and paid a lot of money about it. I mean, you've got to be very, you know, if you're raising money, you have to understand there are laws and rules on it, and they do apply, and and um, and uh, to the extent you are taking money from people you don't know, there's a higher risk. And I, I would say common yeah. sense prevails. Like if um, you are an investor individually and if you like those kind of approaches uh, from uh, the people that you do not know, will you entertain? The same way it goes on the other side as well. So being a founder, um, I, I think work with the existing uh, relationships and, and people that you know already. So I think those approaches at the very initial stages at least, it, it works. Um, and that's a kind of common sense approach. Uh, I think you had, a, I mean, the, the, the issue that you run into is um, raising money is really hard. And, and, and I, I find investors are often lemmings meaning that you could be trying to raise money for a year to two years and get nowhere. And then you find one person who just loves your idea and they invest. And now a whole bunch of other investors come in, right? And, and, and you see that all the time where they just, you find that one and then you can raise you know, a fair amount of money. So it's, there's this tension here of, of, of doing, doing anything to raise money and, and until you get to that point, it's really hard. And so you, you meaning the entrepreneur, you know, you run into somebody who say, hey, I can introduce you to these 10 people, but pay me a 20% fee, um, even if they're not registered broker dealer. Or, you know, I've got all these people who are going to write me $5,000 checks and they can get me to the next stage. All those things have issues and consequences and um and if you don't follow securities laws you know the people who who are and the company fails you can have some real personal liability and risk there so it's, it's i think we are um a little over 20 18 minutes over time um if anybody has not submitted the questions, um, I think we can wrap it up with some closing thoughts. If there's any closing thoughts you want to provide or anything that we're missing, that should we go over? No, I just appreciate it. You know, people have questions correctly. Um, I normally do this live and, and have a great conversation. Um, um, and usually, one of these issues are coming up for somebody directly. Um, but again, if people have questions, just email me more than happy to answer them. And, um, and the, the, the main thing is when you're raising money, you know, talk to your lawyer or talk to an advisor who's done this many times before and don't always trust what you read on the internet as being right. And don't always trust to, to say, People do this all the time because uh, a lot of people do it wrong and, and things matter, they matter. And um, again, I gave you the example where my client put stuff on the internet saying, you know, I'm trying to sell stock thinking that see would never find out. And guess what? They, it was found out and, you know, they had six months of living hell. So, um, you know, you got to take these rules um, seriously. Hi, Larry, this is Rohit. One last question, if um, uh, I'm allowed to ask. Yes. Okay. Um, are you uh, helping startups with the EIDL and PPP applications? Uh, um, we, we, we have a whole task force um, uh, on, on the COVID crisis that's helping clients with questions throughout it. We actually aren't... Um, um doing the actual applications if that the question was help you with the actual application right. no we're i don't think 
you know, we are, we are, we definitely have a whole team that's totally on top of it, answering questions. Um, but we're not actually, you know, that, that would be more like a CPA or an accountant that would, would help you with those questions. Thank you. About the applications. Um, there, yeah, but, um, but, um, there's been lots of, lots of, um, you know, press about the PPA, which we could talk about at a different time. I would encourage you to go to our um, um, last thoughts. Uh, Larry, where encourage you to go where? Oh, so if you've got questions about the COVID crisis, we've got a really excellent uh, website um, that is talking from the the PPA to the loans to. Uh, how to restart your business to, to what you can do. I mean, it's, it's, it's comprehensive and it's international. So it provides, you know, um, sources, because I know you guys have a number of um, companies in your program that are international also. Um, so um, if you go to org.com, www.org.com, I could send you the link, but it's, it's a daily update every day of what's going on with the new rules. And then once a week, there's a webinar. I think there's one tomorrow again. The webinar we're talking about, you know, steps companies are going to need to do to reopen, and and um, um, from cleaning to just you know, all 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 the steps you're going to probably see when you finally reopen. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a reopening in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Or June first, I hope. Awesome. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, we ha we're going to have a similar uh, another topic that we're discussing uh, VC fundraising uh, part two with Larry next week, same time. So um, I'll be sending the links to you guys later today and posting LinkedIn. Feel free to join. And um, thank you so much, Larry, for sharing your thoughts. I mean, this was very, very like I would say this knowledge was very you know important to know if anyone who's actually raising capital yeah i i call it as a tech a technical details it's, it's technical i agree but hopefully but, but you need to know these technical details if you're raising capital you know yes that okay. will give you the leverage to negotiate or maneuver whatever yep i totally agree thank you larry my pleasure guys have a nice day good luck everybody thank you, today.